What I will share with you this afternoon is something quite different in that I am fascinated by, by the ways in which we can affect our health span and our lifespan using really simple behavioral tools. I do a good deal of research on PTSD and my particular research focus is veterans getting back from Afghanistan and Iraq. I've been very concerned that America not repeat the mistakes of the Vietnam War where we brought back 250,000 people with PTSD from Vietnam, didn't have any good treatments, didn't integrate them into society very well, and the result was a lost generation with all kinds of social problems, medical problems, and mental health problems. And in the course of looking for PTSD treatments for this new generation of veterans coming back, we've found some quite remarkable things. So remarkable that I was in Congress uh, two weeks ago speaking to a number of congressmen, including the heads of the uh, House Armed Services Committee and Veterans Affairs Committees, about using some of these new technologies in the VA. But they also turned out to have really potent anti-aging and health span implications, which I'll share with you today. So, oh, going in the wrong direction over here. So I'm going to do a quick review also of how these therapies affect us epigenetically. I'm doing some work now researching not just the mental health implications, but also the physiological implications at the level of the genome. We found, for example, now that PTSD sufferers have really unique genetic characteristics, and it appears that their traumatic emotional experiences are acting as an epigenetic trigger, actually triggering various kinds of changes in their cells. So these stress markers that we pick up in DNA and RNA are interesting. And they're, again, the physiological correlates of these psychological states. Now, just a very, very quick review here in three minutes or less about proteins. We know proteins are complex molecules. We know they have electrical charges at different points on their, on their structure, that they fold over on each other. And we require these blueprints called genes to build them. Our bodies require the blueprints of the gene to build the, these very, very complex structures of which there are over 100,000 in our body. That's why at the start of the Human Genome Project 20 years ago, we thought we would find 120,000 or so genes in the human body. And one of the great unsolved mysteries is why we found, we found only 24,000 of them. Because we thought that, okay, there are 100,000 proteins, it takes a uh, a gene to build a protein, so we'll find 100,000 genes plus maybe 20,000 regulatory genes to orchestrate the whole show. We found far fewer, and that began to upset this central fact of molecular biology. Sir Francis Crick and Crick and Watson discovered the double helix structure of DNA in the mid-1950s, and the, uh, the key paper was Sir Francis Crick's paper in Nature in 1970, which was called The Central Dogma of Molecular Biology. And it states that DNA, of course, produces RNA, which has the code for a protein, and that the interactions are only in one direction from DNA to RNA to protein, and never the other way around. So he even was able to extend this to behavioral aspects of our, of our, of our identity, our being. In his final book, Sir Francis Crick wrote that you, even your joys and sorrows, memories, ambitions, everything, is nothing more than the dance of your neurochemistry. And that view, of course, is called genetic determinism. And it's been the dominant model for a half century. The only problem is that there are big problems with that model. If the model was correct, 
then identical twins should have the same health outcomes and the same disease outcomes and the same lifespan outcomes because after all they have exactly the same genome so two babies born with the same genes but what we find instead is that they don't they in fact have very very different outcomes they they die on average more than 10 years apart now think about that for a moment identical twins starting life with exactly the same genome die on average more than 10 years apart they often have very different health outcomes as well this uh, this talk is based on my book called The Genie in Your Genes, in which I review over 400 scientific studies and show how all of these factors affect the genome and your health. This set of pictures is, is a quite amazing. It's drawn from a BBC documentary released last year. And these two little girls, Olivia and Isabella Murphy, are six years old. At the age of two, Olivia Murphy, the twin on the left, developed childhood leukemia, a strongly inherited disease. Okay, Why did Isabella not develop childhood leukemia? So it's been four years, and these big changes open up between twins so quickly. As the uh, researchers began to try, uh, try to attempt to answer this question, why would these two two girls with the same genes had different health outcomes, they were able to trace Olivia's leukemia to one factor, and that was the stress of a tonsillectomy at the age of six months. The stress of that tonsillectomy, they believe, was the biggest different, different event in the, the lives of these two, two girls. Uh, telomeres. There's a lot of talk about telomeres at the conference, and now you can now uh, get private telomere tests, and they'll tell you on this scale, you can, you can send in a blood sample without telling the lab what age the patient is, and they'll tell you, here's the age axis over here, and they'll tell you what age that patient is biologically based on their telomere length, okay? Well, they analyzed telomeres from these two identical twins, Sue and Sheila Wright, from Kent in the UK. And they found that their telomeres showed that biologically Sue was 10 years older than Sheila at the age of 39. Now, how by her late 30s, born with exactly the same genetic deck of cards, could the, the health and lifespans of these two people have diverged so dramatically in just four decades. Again, they traced it to stress. They traced it to the stress in the case of Sue, of a husband who had Huntington's disease and became disabled, and Sue cared for him. And the stress of taking care, care of him, he was verbally abusive, she gained a lot of weight, she began smoking, all the usual risk factors. But by, before 40, the biological age of her cells, as measured by her telomeres, was 10 years older than that of her sister.